Hello everybody, so this is the lecture looking at habitat fragmentation. So we've talked a little bit about this so far, but it's kind of been, um, we've skirted around the issue. So now I want to spend some time thinking about how natural areas respond to being cut up into tiny different little pieces. And we're basically going to spend, you know, time thinking about the, what happens when habitat is lost, fragmented, and then the effects of that fragmentation. So first off, I think what we need to understand that um, natural habitat, remember, is the biggest threat to biodiversity worldwide, right? What we're seeing is uh, the world population in industrialized developed countries has pretty much stabilized, but where we're seeing this huge increase is going to be from the developing countries. And what that means is we're going to need way more space for just four people, right? For food and everything that people need to live. So when we think about, you know, where natural habitat right now is being taken away, um, that is in, you know, areas like the tropics. So this is an example from uh, Central America where we see this is, you know, pristine natural rainforest habitat that now we can see between 1950 and 85, a lot of it has gone away at this point. The thing we got to realize, though, is that habitat destruction, when we are changing, you know, the native habitat, whether it's a forest or grassland or whatever, it happens in these weird kind of patches. So we can see here, generally what you have is like a main road with then short little roads spiking off of that. And we can see that develop, they develop like along those roads, right? So you get these weird habitats. So if this is native uh, rainforest right here, what we've got then is tiny, sorry about this link, I'm not sure. Um, what we've got are these, you know, tiny patches of small natural rainforest, but that is not going to act the same as if this whole patch was a big habitat, a big, you know, native rainforest. So um, we can define habitat fragmentation then as the disruption of extensive habitats into isolated and smaller patches. So imagine you have some, let's say this is a tall grass prairie. Okay. What do we do? We add some farmland, ranching land with pigs and cows and put a road through it and then put a city over there. So what we're left with is the two habitats no longer being... Um, equal. Now they're not equal for a variety of reasons. The biggest reason is that it reduces the total amount of habitat area, right? So we no longer have a big patch. We have these smaller areas right here, right? Um, so it reduces the total amount of native tall grass prairie in this case. Now the um, when we think about reduction of air area, if the area that a um, like that's left over is smaller than the territory or a home range of an animal, that animal is not going to be able to survive there. So think about cougars, right? Mountain lions, you might call them. Um, they require 400 square kilometers. That's just one of them, right? One cougar requires 400 square kilometers. One grizzly bear requires 900 square kilometers that's just one right so you need to have a sustainable population you need more than that so as you in decrease the total amount of area in a fragmentation scenario you're gonna have less food these organisms are need to gonna have to move around in there this habitat and fragmented um, landscape so they're going to have more conflicts with humans, and what that really means is increased mortality, right? Whether it's accidental running into, you know, deer crossing roads and getting hit by cars, or if it's a grizzly bear, you know, coming into the city, that grizzly bear is probably going to get shot, right? So um, when we reduce area, it's you know, pretty much all the time we see a reduction in the number of species, starting with those species that require so, so many 
um, so much area. So um, w there's things called area sensitive species. So an example is this wood thrush here. So this is a small bird that's found in Maryland. Um, and what we see is it doesn't really need that much space, right? But what you find in area of forest in a hectare, so a hectare is 100 meters by 100 meters, so not very big, basically like one city block. So even if the, um, the forest is one city block, there's only about a 50% chance of finding it. Really, what it needs to have a good chance of finding it, you need some like 30 hectares or something, so 30 big you know, city blocks. Um, area sensitive species, it can respond for a variety of reasons, um, but essentially what they all need is much larger tracts of either native habitat than the size of their territories. When we do um, habitat fragmentation though, we also increase the proportion of edges. So in the original uh, habitat, let's say, you know, let's say this is now a forest, okay? Um, there was only this amount of edge. But now we've got a lot of edges around every single habitat patch. And what we see is as you get smaller and smaller patches, the percentage of the patch that is edge increases. So this small patch here, you know, like if you go in, I don't know, let's say 10 meters, okay? Um, 10 meters from the edge of this square, all the way around, you only get a little bit of what we call this interior habitat. You get most habitat as as the edge, okay? As, as you get smaller, right? Bigger habitats still don't have, the, you know, this is a lot of edge, but it's not as a big of a proportion. And the shape also matters. So if you have just a square or a circle or something, you can have a decent amount of that core habitat. So in this example here, we have 47 hectares of this total area and the core area might be something like 20 hectares, right? But if you have a shape that's this, let's say this shape here did take 47 hectares, um, there's essentially no core area in here because it's all this, you know, these skinny little projections. Now, why does this matter, right? Well, edges are different than the interior habitat for a variety of different reasons. There's more sun, right? So think about this forest. If this was all just, you know, a big canopy, you, but when you, when, if it's all a big canopy, there isn't that much light going to be able to make it to the forest floor. But as you cut up to a certain area, that sunlight can hit the forest floor and really can't change conditions in this edge area. You can have more wind. And essentially what you get is different microclimates. So the microclimate in here will be different than in here. Oftentimes there's lower humidity, more wind, more light. What that means then is some species do well in edge and really others do not. So this, um, you know, like a grizzly bear is an example of definitely a um, interior core type of species. Whereas white-tailed deer actually really, really do well in edges. So it's um, uh, very well known that uh, in many states in the United States, we have way more deer now than we did before European colonization of the, uh, of the continent. And that's because that deer just really explode in numbers when there's a lot of edge habitat. So right now we probably have three to four to five times the amount of deer that we used to pre-European settlement. And it's not just deer and these big animals. It's true for, you know, animals, plants, microbes, fungi, all sorts of things. It also um, really changes predation. So Cats are super cute, right? And I've said before in this class, I really dislike cats. Um, but what we see 
is a lot of introduced predators, so domestic cats, are really good at uh, being predators in the edge habitat. So if you think about, and it's, it's not just introduced non-native predators, it's also things like, <coughs> excuse me, things like coyotes, and if you find, if you go to Africa, like wolves or lions, and um, a lot of the big cats will be using these roads because it's frankly just easier to, I should say, using the edge habitat because it's easier to traverse and walk through compared to the interior, maybe the thick forest that is in that habitat. So this graph here is looking at um, distance from the forest edge, meaning, okay, this is like right at the edge of the forest and this is deeper into the forest and how much um, predation that there was. And you can see that, you know, this is looking at quail eggs in experimental nests and right along the edge, all of those nests got predated upon very quickly. So, um, a lot of predators will patrol the edges of, um, of habitat patches because they know it is so such a good opportunity for them just to travel around to see farther and able to um, have a, you know, be more successful predators, essentially. So the question you might ask is how deep is that edge? Like, does it, if a forest, are you going to get to that normal microclimate of an interior of a forest after 10 meters, after 100 meters, after a mile? It, what it, we, we can look at is, um, so this is you know, humidity for humidity. And let's see, this is in Amazon rainforest. Um, humidity go, gets back to normal after about 100 meters into the forest. Soil moisture, a little less. Um, air temperature, about 60 meters here. Uh, birds at about 50 meters. Uh, but when we think of like um, certain types of butterflies, it takes 250 meters into the forest to get um, the the natural community of organisms that you would expect. And I mean, even trees themselves are dying at higher rates up to 200 meters into the forest. And you know, okay, 200 meters, that's not that bad, depending on the size of the fragment. If your fragment is several square miles, that's not that bad, right? But the thing is, the edge is a moving target. Because you cut down to this certain area, you get experience more tree mortality um, in, you know, at the edge, such that the edge kind of continues to creech, creep back from the, uh, the original wherever it was cut. So oftentimes you can have like shrinking size of fragments, which just compounds the problem of habitat fragmentation in the first place. So um, one thing we haven't talked about yet is isolation. So in, you know, the original forest fragment that we had, a, uh, a grizzly bear can move from over here to over here, no problem, right? Um, but what about in this scenario? Does a grizzly bear want to walk through these houses? Can a grizzly bear walk from this patch through the cattle pasture over to here? And the answer is, well, I don't know. It depends on the species, right? You can, we know that some species have no problem. Like a white-tailed deer would be able to walk through a residential area, no problem. Through a, a cattle field, no problem, right? But certain species won't do that. And what, so what you get then is an isolation, right? So certain species won't move without of the, out of their patch. And what that eventually turns into is a loss of species. So you get higher inbreeding, you get lower genetic diversity, and diseases can come in and wipe, wipe whole populations out. Get problems with metapopulation dynamics. I'm not really going to go into that right yet, but 
if we think about a, maybe a landscape with a bunch of patches and when it turns white you get these localized extinctions now these extinctions are happening in the background at all times but there's also recolonization events from other patches but the smaller the patch is basically what you end up with is everything going extinct due to these problems with these this inbreeding depression so um, again, that ability to move is species specific. Okay, it's a dependent on the matrix. The matrix is, is in this in this context looking at you know the spaces in between the patches, right? So um, deer have no problem crossing roads, but you know a the the for a tiny little mouse or something that might be completely impassable. One, what we see is when organisms um, are, you know, walking between patches, it kind of depends on the, the type, right? So um, let's say we're in a tropical rainforest and we have monkeys wanting to get from one patch to another. Now, a monkey is probably not going to cross this um, pineapple field, right? But a monkey might be able to swing through the trees and walk on the ground a little bit for a banana plantation or a pasture, but it's probably not going to go through a, um, a car park either, right? Um, what we generally see is the more human-oriented the use is, the more um, more restrictive that is for movements of all, all sorts of species. So um, to avoid this big problem, we want to kind of look for certain solutions. So one of the solutions uh, for habitat fragmentations that's been posited is what about corridors, okay? So what if you had some forest patches? So here's two forest patches. When what if you connected them with some amount of forest, maybe little islands or, I mean, if it allows a whole big, like, plant plant a plantation of trees in between these two patches and maybe you'll get less isolation so that the individuals in this patch can freely walk through over to this patch. Now the good things is that it does facilitate movement and it would increase the p potential for recolonization. So in like if it was in this scenario you wouldn't necessarily expect if uh, the mice population crashes and dies in this um, in this patch the mice are not going to be able to make it there. But maybe if um, there's a corridor they would and these individuals start dying out there can be a flow of individuals from here to go up and it's also just extra habitat right now it's definitely edge habitat which we know is not as desirable as the core habitat but it is l at least something but not all organisms actually use these um, corridors um, it can also s help the spread of diseases so if, you know, if there was a disease in this patch, it's probably not going to make it in this scenario, whereas the disease could follow the organisms that are moving into this patch if there is some connectivity. So um, it also then exposes animals to danger, right? Because in the corridor, it's closer to all the human use movements that are going to be expected along that corridor. So um, there's pros and cons to these corridor ideas. Oh, it's also very expensive to do this, right? You know, how do you replant a whole entire forest and making connect a bunch of different patches can be ve relatively different. I do want to spend some time thinking about roads, though, as a specific type of matrix, because roads, we don't really think, we as humans don't think of them as insurmountable barriers, right? It's very easy, you know, you just have a road, just walk across it, no problem. And for a white-tailed deer, that's easy, depending on how much traffic there is on the road, right? Now, if there's a huge whiz of traffic going by all the time, 24-7, um, yeah, that, that is a barrier. But, you know, think about a rural road that doesn't have cars going that often. A deer or something is going to be able to cross that very easily. But if you're a tiny little mouse, that road is a huge danger. And why is that? Is because... Uh, mice don't, one of their biggest predators are like hawks. And 
they you know usually mice scurry around uh, underneath as much as they can and s staying around trees and fallen logs and stuff so that they don't um, don't get eaten don't get seen by predators and what we see is that um, even small roads can have a pretty big impact on the behavior of smaller organisms right the, the, a small t one lane gravel mode road might be completely impassable because of the behavior of a small rodent or something that would never dare to cross that road because they would think they would get be getting they would be eaten so this has been a big deal um, in national parks because um, a lot of national parks want to get people in want to get people to visit their national park and how do you do that well you build roads so people can drive their car so you can you know have trains going through it um, so the more you have people visit it the less the national park is going to have animals due to more habitat fragmentation so Banff National Park it's uh, north it's in Alberta Canada uh, just north of Glacier National Park in Montana and they this this is basically the whole national park here and what they have is an interstate a big the trans canada highway it's one of the biggest highways in southern canada and um, it bisects the park completely so if you can think then you know it's a complete big two lane or four lane highway separated lanes with a median and that's a pretty big deal for a lot of um, these organisms so um, we, they didn't want to have just completely um, separate populations of different organisms so they built all sorts of different um, corridors between them so they made super big underpasses and that's all the little orange bars along here and they made one two three four wildlife overpasses so they basically made bridges over the road that had some amount of like dirt and natural habitat to see if um, the organisms the the elk and the deer and the bears and the wolves would be crossing over these these habitats the question is did this actually work um, it was a big experiment it was pretty expensive to do as you can imagine this you know wildlife overpass here is pretty expensive kind of a big deal to do and um, there was kind of a learning curve for the animals they didn't use them right away but they've been there for a while now and what we see is some species use them more and so reduce the mortality of ungulates so those are things like deer um, bighorn sheep moose, elk, uh, mountain goats, and that kind of thing. Um, and so it reduced the mortality by, of those by 80%. So that's amazing, right? That's, that's great. These things actually worked. Uh, but it increased the mortality of bears by about 116%. Now, there might have been um, something uh, else going on, but... Um, that caused these mortality of bears we don't know but it happened at the same time and these were like car killed bears so you know there are some mixed results about how whether we should be using these things now do you care about bear more do you care about elk more you know that's kind of a decision for the managers and you know what we should expect and there's some thought of how do we like help help these bears figure out how to use these things so that they can live in this natural area while still having a decent amount of human use uh, so that's it for this lecture uh, hope you enjoyed it and see y'all later